Thank you very much, Pat. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of, what shall I call this? I used to call it the criminal calendar back in the days when Scottsdale TV hosted our um, author talks, which morphed into our own, and now thanks to Zoom, have morphed into a pretty constant stream. I am Barbara Peters, and I'm wearing my sunglasses because I had eye surgery. I could tell you I thought I was Anna Wintour for this evening, but <laughs> I don't think that'll go. Um, and since I can barely see through the sunglasses, <laughs> oh. I'm hoping that that's actually Stephen Spotswood on the other screen. Is that you, It Stephen? is. It is. Hi. <laughs> How yeah. yeah, wonderful. And this is his lovely new book called Secrets Typed in Blood. Um, and interestingly enough, it has a Christmas color scheme, which I don't know. Is that deliberate, Stephen, or is that accidental? I, I'm pretty sure that is accidental. Since every book like is, it will be coming out in December, like I, we can't all have Christmas color schemes, but this is just a happy accident. I think. Well, of course, blood, you know, that, that part is perfectly clear. And the typewriter indicates that this is one of my favorite kinds of books because this is to some degree a bookish mystery, or at least writing and publishing and books are um, part of the plot. So last time, or was it the time before? Because this is the third book we've done together. Yeah. They running together in my aging mind. One was the circus background. Was that the last one or the first that one? Was, that was book two, that was Murder Under Skin. Okay, yeah. it was. And book one was? Fortune Favors the Dead. Right, but what, what was the general um, culture of the book, landscape of the book? What, you say what I, I'm sorry, you're you're breaking up a little bit. I am? Oh. Yeah, your, your voice cut out. I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't hear the second half of that question. All right. My question was, in book two, there was a circus background. In book one, what was the general background of the story? Uh, general background of book one was a sort of high society Halloween. <laughs> like the murder half takes place at a, um, a masquerade uh, party and like sort of like the the last gasp of like that high society, like 20s, 30s era, um, like still post-World War II, but like that last. Right. So why did, you pick, why did you pick World War II as the, as the time period for your books? Well, I kind of, um, that's sort it's like that, that point between the end of World War II and the beginning of the 50s, it's sort of like drastically overlooked. Like we know World War II, and then we know the 50s and there's like this shift that it's a massive cultural pivot point um, where all of these things happen and the sort of mythos of the American dream got hammered out um, or at least like how we think of it today like the white picket fence and like the sprawling suburbs and like all those suburbs began um, when the soldiers came home um, and I really wanted to like it's a time period I really enjoy writing about, but it's also a time period where uh, there's a lot of like uh, people and cultures that you know were basically got paved over while we were like creating this American dream. Like a lot of people um, didn't get to take part in America's golden age, and I like I I want to like my goal is to tell hopefully compelling mysteries uh, while at the same time highlighting sort of these little nooks and crannies of American history um, to show maybe that like what we think of as the golden age was not always always so golden at least not well, yeah. I think that's true of any golden age I'm fascinated with it because actually I was born in 1940 so you're writing about a time when I was um, mm -hmm. old enough now um, by 1947 which is the year that um, secrets typed in blood occurs um, I was already you know in grade school and remember all this fairly well. So I'm finding it so, you know, it's, it's hard when your life turns into history. <laughs> if you live long enough, which I yeah. am lucky enough to do, it is true. And we recently had a debate. Uh, Larry King wrote a really wonderful book called Back to, the, Back to the Garden. And it's set in the 1970s. And we had a big discussion about whether or not I could make that um, a choice for our historical fiction book club. And I realized that when I started the story in 1989, the 50 year bar went back before the war, right? But mm -hmm. in the 33 years that has passed, the bar has moved up. And now I think one could say if 50 years is kind of a dividing line between contemporary and historical mystery, and that's just an arbitrary figure, I mean, it could be anything, um, that the 1970s suddenly, you know, have become historical. Mm -hmm. That was a real shock. Yeah. 
No, I I mean, I I was alive for a couple of years in the 70s. Like, yeah, that's to know that that is now historical is, oh, that's a kick. <laughs> so 1980, you're set your books in New York City. So um, the automobile culture, I mean, there are automobiles in your book and people are driving, but the, the real American automobile culture didn't really kick off until probably 46 because it took a while to go from making weapons of war to cars. I remember mm -hmm. that we didn't have a car during the war and we had to share my grandparents, which meant we had to keep walking across Winnetka to their house. But by 46, we had a car, a Buick, and by 48 or 49, we had two. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that's a big part of the time you're writing about. But in New York, a car, in many ways, is a liability. It's so incredibly expensive to, you know, garage one and do all the rest of it that people are more inclined to take taxis. Although you do have people driving in your book. I do have people driving in the book. I also, in Secrets Type and Blood, there's a lot of, of, of Will in the subway. Um, yep. Which is fun. Um, yeah, when she's commuting to office and her disguise mm -hmm. is, um, you know, her undercover work. Yeah. She is riding the subway and she talks about that, about, you know, her fellow passengers and imagining, you know, them chewing, throwing and what their lives might be like. But um, anyway, I think, I mean, New York, New York is never typical. It's certainly not mid-America. Um, and so mm -hmm. things that, you know, are occurring in New York are not necessarily things that were occurring in Chicago, for example, or the suburbs that you're talking about. Anyway, um, so we have two people here. We have Ms. Pentecost and we have Will Jean Parker. Ms. Pentecost has an interesting physical problem. Why, why did you pick upon that? Because I, it certainly really adds a lot of dimension to her character yeah. and how she works. Yeah, so uh, Ms. Pentecost has MS. Um, and in the 1940s, it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, there is no cure today. Um, no. but in the 1940s, like the, the sort of the treatments that we have don't, didn't exist. Um, so she is, she has, it, it does add like a, it adds like the narrative dimension of, um, of she is under the ticking clock of wanting to do all the things she needs to do before she can't, um. And it puts Will under pressure to become good enough um, and smart enough and capable enough to take over for Miss Pentecost when when she can't anymore. Um, as for why I did it, uh, it, I think part of it is that I, I spent almost, oh gosh almost twenty years now uh, as I'm writing in medical journalism, um, and it, mostly it's, it's mostly veterans affairs stuff. So it's a, like a lot of PTSD and uh, traumatic brain injury and things like that, but also writing regularly about chronic illnesses and sort of the um, the way that people with chronic illnesses have to adapt because society will not adapt for them. Um, like how a lot of these illnesses, like the symptoms can vary from day to day and people wake up like not knowing like what kind of day they're gonna be in, but you know, that's MS to a T. Um, yeah, so, and you just don't see a lot of that representation um, in books uh, where it's not like tragic. Like I don't want it, to, I want it to be like realistic. Um, like she has a flare up um, in book three and I'm like, I want that to be realistic, but at the same time, I don't want it to to be, oh, woe is, woe is Lillian Pentecost. Um, like sh she is really good at her job in spite of. Um, well, it doesn't affect her mental processes at all. No, not yet. She is, that is a thing she is concerned about. Um, yeah. This MS does have like a lot of, a lot of symptoms that, that affect like memory and cognition. Yeah. I really like the scene where you had her doing exercises to, you know, deal with her. Um, and, and actually, you, you know, you managed to inject humor into that. Um, yeah. Not making fun of her, but, you know, sort of sympathetic humor, but you know, at one point she's talking like with her head down between her knees or something because she's doing all this stretching and, and all. And, and I, I really like that. This is before the ADA Act. So, you know, mm -hmm. people like her pretty much on their own. But, yeah. You know, but anyway, it, you know, the other great thing about writing historical fiction is that you, you can actually start a new case the day after or even the minute after 
um, you've ended a new one. So you can you can spend years in 1947 and 48, and she hasn't she doesn't have to get worse dramatically. Yes. Yeah. That's I've thought about that a lot. Um, right now I'm sort of on like a six a six month gap between books um that's very loose um but that's i think sort of the average is that i'm like each of these mysteries take place about six months or so after the one before it so it, it does allow me to squeeze even though these come out or have been coming out yearly it allows me to squeeze in more um before before we progress into the 1950s which is going to be yeah no why not yeah. I remember when Lindsay Davis wrote her second book, it literally started a minute after the first book. Um, yes. You know, we were back in ancient Rome. And I really liked that. Um, you know, there was um, continuity. Um, you had, you could reflect on the earlier case because it was so close in time mm -hmm. you know, that um, the ramifications of it were, were instantly ongoing. I yes. really like that. Yeah. Great. So why don't you give us the setup for this? Because it's a really nifty setup. Sure. Um, this is gonna be the first time I have done this elevator pitch in in public <laughs> I in digital find public. It with you, if you miss it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, Will and Lillian are approached by Holly Quick, who is a pulp mystery writer who writes for the pulp magazines under a pseudonym, um, and she, or actually multiple pseudonyms, and she has discovered that someone is recreating her fictional murders in real life. There have been three of them so far. Um, really gruesome, elaborate scenes uh, that resemble to a T the stories that she published um, in Strange Crimes magazine, um, which is a fictional pulp publication. Um, and Will and Lillian are tasked with uh, with finding out who. Um, it's basically I've been surrounding as like a hard-boiled queer serial killer who done it. Uh, set in in 1947 New York, um, and for for longtime readers, if you've if you've been reading from the beginning, um, you know that in Fortune Favors the Dead we introduced uh, Olivia Waterhouse, who is a sort of recurring. Uh, it's very hard to talk about her without like any spoilers, um, but she comes back um, in in book three. Um, and Will is actually like throughout the course of book three, she is actually working undercover as a secretary, trying to track down something about Olivia Waterhouse, um, which puts her weirdly off the board. Um, she has to work a day job as a secretary while at night tracking down a serial killer. Um, yeah, that's, I'll shorten that for the next time. I think. <laughs> No, I think I think there's actually parts we could elaborate. One of the things you did very well in this book was writing about women's clothing and the the confines or the personalities that it conveys. For example, when when Will has to go work the as the secretary, she has to force her way into a pencil skirt, for example, and decide whether she's going to wear heels and other things. And Miss um, Pentecost, when she is suffering symptoms of her MS, she has to change her clothing. She has to something really informal. You have a scene where she shows up in gym pants and a big sweater or something of the sort, you know, and and you wonder, you know, whether, especially back then, today, nobody wears, you know, I mean, anything goes, but back then, clothes were, I think, much more, um, you had to, you, what you wore related to what were, where you were, what you were doing. It was a more formal area, era mm -hmm. for sure. So it gave Miss Pentecost moments when she was less formal. Um, and it, it confines Will when she goes to work in the office. Um, she's not, you know, she's not comfortable in the clothes that she's wearing. So I yeah. sort of, I like that, you know, because it, in women's clothes, well, actually men's clothes were the same for forever. I mean, if you look at an 18th century guy, you can hardly imagine why, how they moved. They were wearing high heels, they were wearing wigs, yeah. they were wearing makeup, they were wearing very tight clothes and all, and that would certainly affect how you move through the world. Yeah, this is one of the most surprising things about writing the series is that I have learned so much more about women's fashion, women's vintage fashion, yeah. than I ever thought I would need to. Um, 
And thank God for the internet. Uh, and there are whole catalogs from like every like season of every year that people have like Sears and Robux catalogs that they have just scanned and that are available online, which is wonderful because it means that I can find like the the clothes that actual people wore rather than like the stuff you'll find in Vogue um, or like the historical photographs. Like it's just, it's great. Um, but yeah. That's true, and you do have ordinary, but you have one moment when um, I can't think, I'm sorry, names are gonna, I'm not my thing anymore, but when they go to see the, the um, guy running the club and he has a woman who's a bodyguard, you ever dressed yeah. in Christian Dior, the new look? And, you know, and you just have a little line about, you know, Christian advised me or something. You have to really know about Christian and Dior and the new look to pick up on that. Yes. Yeah. And she got it early. <laughs> the, like, it's, it's a little tiny joke to myself because I think that's that show where he debuted the new look happened. Like, it happens in like one month after um, the scene takes place or something like right. that. And so, like, she got it early and that's a big deal. And Will has no idea what it means. She it's, doesn't have any idea what yeah. it means. But the fact that this woman whose name starts with A, I keep wanting to call her Agrippina or something. But it's it's, it's it's Alethea. Thank you. Um, obviously, has some personal connection. I mean, you wouldn't normally just say, you know, Christian told me or something. So, mm -hmm. you know, I yeah. thought there was, I thought you were going to actually do something with that. I thought it was possible that we were going to discover that, you know, somehow or other she, you know, regularly went to Paris or or something because I don't I don't think Christian Dior showed in New York back then, did he? Or at least not at the very outset. I that is beyond my research, but uh -huh. I probably not. This is like the very beginning of of that of his giant influence, I think. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Well, that um, you look but you will. I I Alethea is one of those characters that is going to stick around. Um, I she's too much fun um, for me not to play more with her. Absolutely. You wouldn't want to waste her after you, you know, later she shows up in trousers that have a split so she can access a weapon, I think it is, or something. But no, I really, I thought she was great. There are a lot of interesting women in this book. Um, and I'm glad that some of them, particularly since you've got this compressed time frame, you know, it's perfectly realistic that they'll keep going. Actually, most of the men in the book are kind of despicable. The women are by far the better. <laughs> uh yeah, maybe a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. It's right. Well, anyway, um, so based on what you said, if if Miss Pentecost and Parker, if they are going to take on this case, um, logically they're going to have to figure out how how these stories. I mean, one of them turns out not to have been published yet. So you have to figure out who has access to the stories, who would have, you know, there, there are multiple points in the investigation, but there are also multiple things going on. So it's a, it's a complicated plot. Do you, are you a person who works all that out in advance or do you just kind of move along and things suggest themselves? I don't work everything out in advance. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, know, I'll know the beginning, I'll know the ending and I'll have like, Tent pole moments that I'm I'm working towards, um, but how I get from those big moments to big moments, I don't. I kind of discover in process, and usually, like I will during writing the first draft, I will end up creating like new characters and new twists, and like probably like thirty percent of it gets created in the first draft, like just in that in discovery. Um, so yeah, so I don't, I do not always know everything. Well, that, no, I think that sounds yeah. like fun, but to make this plot work out, it it would seem to me you sort of had to know the, the very end game, but maybe not. Yeah, well, I knew the, I, let me think, did I know the end game? Yeah, yes, yes, I knew, I knew the end game. It was like the, the, the stuff in the middle, I don't always know. I think it was like Neil Gaiman who said that revising is just basically like making, taking that mess of a first draft and making it so like beautiful and pretty and making it look like you meant it, like this was the intention all along. Um, I think it was him and he said it much more succinctly than that, but yeah. Like my first drafts are messy, messy, incoherent. It's not incoherent, but like big plot holes. Um, and then 
I just slowly refine and nail down all the, the carpet corners. There's this always, you know, comes up, are you a plotter, a plotter or a pantser? And I don't know why you can't be both. I mean, I don't no. know why you can't have, you know, kind of a general outline or, or skeleton of a story, but then the fun would come, yeah. all the unexpected moments that you get to take as you're wending your way towards it. Yeah, I think it's a it's a spectrum, like plots and pants. Like, like you can fall anywhere in between there and you don't always have to stick to the same thing every time, every book, yeah. Right, so there was a really interesting book that came out, I think it was in November, maybe October, by Lauren D. Estelman, who's got like a thousand awards to his name and has been writing forever. And it's called Paperback Jack. And he decided that he too would write about the immediate post-war era and he would focus on not just the pulps, but the rise of the paperback book, which you know was that whole market really took off after World War II. And you know, these are books that were found in grocery stores and drugstores and you know, airplanes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the pulps kind of gave way to a great degree to the paperback. Did you look into any of that when you were right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was it's it was interesting. Like you had the like the heyday of the pulps in like the twenties and thirties, and then radio came in and sort of just started taking nibbles away um, because people could get their their crime stories or their romance stories elsewhere. Um, and then yeah, the rise of the paperback and post World War II just blew the just yeah just a little hole right in the pulp magazine market uh, at least the fiction i think the the true crime stuff seems to have stuck around a little longer um yeah just looking so i've spent hours on ebay looking <laughs> for old magazines um but like you you find the true crime stuff going to the 50s 60s 70s um yeah but the fiction stuff um like black mask and things like that just you know they they all the the authors that were in there are now getting are in paperbacks yeah well i mean it was the chief it was actually invented i think in the 30s by penguin but um largely you know it was a cheap a way to mm -hmm. produce books very cheaply make them portable you know people could carry them around if you dropped it in the ocean at the beach you didn't have to cry you know it wasn't an expensive hardcover that kind of thing um, and I do think um, it it was very hard on the on the pulp market. I'm, there a lot of the pulp market was short stories, though, if I remember right, because I mm -hmm. remember icons now no longer with us, like Donald E. Westlake, for example. Um, you know, and he wrote Larry Black, um, who's still with us and still writing. They wrote tons of stories for the pulps. So I'm mean, I don't I mean, did they serialize or did they put whole novels in? What what was your research what did it tell you like i've so i have i have some copies and like just looking it looked like they they did some actually have whole novels sometimes you have, or call them novels they're shortish we might call them novellas today um like a novella and then a couple short stories in one magazine um it depended i, I didn't find many serialized things but i didn't look for serialized real, real deeply. And yeah. I don't think any of my copies of anything. I tend to think of pulp as, as short stories. And, you know, you can go yeah. back to the strand and realize that Conan Doyle wrote Sherlock Holmes short stories because they happened to fit the yep. strand, you know, the magazine public. Whereas Dickens actually, and a lot of authors, they did serialize their novels, um, but they weren't pulp. They were more, you know, magazines. I mean, they were a little more more formal, but the paperback market did make a difference. In Lauren's book, the guy is trying desperately to adjust to, you know, to the paperback and trying to adjust his writing to it and so forth. Are you, if you're going to keep Holly around, you know, is she going to have to do something similar? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, if I keep her around, which would be, that would, that would be a spoiler. <laughs> well, sorry. No, <laughs> it's okay. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm bad at it too. Um, if Holly Quick sticks around, yeah, she will have to, and sticks in the same profession, she will have to think about how she's moving forward. And yeah. let's be real, if Holly is the client that Pentecost and Parker are hired to figure out who's doing this terrible thing and protect her, 
it wouldn't it wouldn't be a good look if she didn't make it all the way through. So maybe maybe it's okay that we have that little spoiler there. Who knows? That's true. We'll yeah. see. We'll see. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's a it's a fascinating time period. Um, what was it like? There's a book out now, Stephen, you might have run across called Lavender House. Does that ring a bell with you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It rings a bell. I have a copy on my to be read shelf. Um, I have not to be read it yet. Well, it's uh, really. But, it, but I, I've, I've heard all about it. Again, like, the plot is like deeply in my wheelhouse. I really. It is. It's a brilliant oh. book, but it also, it's horrifying to realize this is um, about a, a gay man and in amazingly, San Francisco, which of course turned into a haven for same, but back was really terrible in the very early 50s. I think it's 1952 or 53. So um, it is a, it's a queer culture book and an Agatha Christie style. But mm -hmm. what he has to say about how difficult it was, you know, to, to be that way in the, in that time period, how dangerous it was, how isolating it was. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, because Will is a lesbian, um, was it different, do you think, that, that women got away with sort of called lavender marriages or whatever in an easier way than men did? I don't know if I would call it easier. Um, there is, I just am finishing a book now, um, by an author named Hugh Ryan. Um, he, wrote, he previously wrote a book called uh, when, when Brooklyn Was Queer, um, which tracks queer culture throughout the history of New York City, especially like, like from like the beginning of the city up through Stonewall. Um, and he just put out a book um, called um, the, uh, the Women's House of Detention, um, like a queer history of Greenwich Village, something like that. But it's about uh, the House of D, which was this seven or nine story uh, women's prison in Greenwich Village um, and goes through the history of the prison and the history of uh, the criminalization of queer and like non-gender presenting women or people um, in the city and how, and the, the stories that he presents um, and the stories of the, the prisoners that were in this prison over time um, are, Oh, it's it it it's really just like uh, fascinating how the laws were bent against um, queer people, especially women. Um, uh, it uh, for as late as you know, like the nineteen eighties and beyond. Um, like just so, I don't know if it's easier. I just think that there were uh, there were other things that queer women had to deal with in other ways that men maybe didn't. But well, I don't think easier was a good choice of words, but I guess what I was thinking is that it, it wasn't uncommon for women to live together, sisters or mm. whatever. And therefore, I guess less visible is sort of what I meant that um, a, a couple of women could, would not be as obvious perhaps as a pair of men. That's true, yes. Sorry. Yeah. No, I agree with, I, I do agree. I think I agree with that. Um, I think there's certainly historical examples of it. Um, yeah. So why did you choose to make, why did you choose to make Will a lesbian in the same way I asked you earlier, why Miss Pentecost has multiple sclerosis? Um, it's a good question. I, as a playwright, like, uh, I've wrote, written mostly, which, which I was before like 15 years before I started writing novels. Um, I wrote mostly exclusively for, for female protagonists and mostly, most of them were queer. Um, so like a young, young bisexual woman is like my default protagonist like that's who I I have to make myself think of somebody like if, if that's just the default and if I'm going to make it something else I have to force myself to think uh, of something else um, like that's just where I go to uh, and I thought well if I'm and I don't know what came first my like desire to to sort of like investigate like sort of like the look to look at the the late this time period in a different way um, or my desire to 
have will be gay and that's what sparked looking at this time period in a different way um regardless like her being bisexual in 1947 um and and having an active if underground um romantic life is it you know it raises the stakes for her it raises the danger for her it gives us the opportunity to see the city and the country and like just sort of life um from a different point of view absolutely and it has a certain utility value and that you can give a young presumably fertile young woman um a romance without the specter of um pregnancy and childbirth and you know childbearing because it's very difficult to have a credible hard-boiled sleuth who's also a new mom mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know that you thought of that, but I tell you that that is, I won't mention who it is, but a quite a well-known author chose to have a, a gay female protagonist. And I asked why, um, and that was the answer, is that um, it was possible then for this woman to have a romance without complications. It was possible for her to work in a different way with her colleagues, you know? So, I mean, it, it wasn't a, moral position it wasn't a biographical position it was um, just a different way of you know being able to tell a story yeah oh how many plays did you write oh gosh um i i don't know uh more more than 20 less than 40 probably as to how many are actually good maybe maybe like seven or eight that i would and were they were they performed yeah um uh most were performed in and around dc but i had a few that that traveled um and got done in like florida and chicago um cincinnati california um it's all at Cal now canada um so what so, yeah. pushed you into writing novels I, my wife <laughs> um i don't say i want to say she pushed me um my, my wife's a young adult novelist she she's been writing books in the ya market for i think 10 years now um and uh several years back she she suggested i i write a a ya superhero novel because we were watching one of i think it was like the arrow on the cw like just uh just a very cw superhero show um and i was like no that sounds like a terrible idea i don't think i don't i don't read enough ya to write it uh, but then i came up with an idea for a plot and i ended up i ended up writing it um and it was eh. um i wouldn't show it i mean i did show it i actually queried with it but i shouldn't have um and then i thought well i'm gonna try contemporary uh thriller because that's what that's more what i read um I ended up writing like a contemporary thriller um, and queried with that uh, and got a few nibbles. It's a much better book, still not great, but much better. Um, and then like a few years back, it's 2019 now, um, I thought of like I had the spark for, no, 2018, I had the spark for, for Pentecost and Parker um, and just a straight up hard boiled whodunit, uh, which Turns out that's that's just what I was waiting for. It's just to find my niche, um, to find like a genre and the characters that that um, I, I just love to write, um, and hopefully I'm good at. So so yeah, that's how I I made the jump. Um, and it's not like I I left playwriting. Like I'm still I'm, I am still a playwright. I still like teach. I still now that the I don't want to say the pandemic is over, but at least things are open. Um, hopefully I can get back into theaters again. Uh, but now novel writing is the vast majority of my time since it's so many more words than, than the average well, play. You know, all of it was preparation for writing novels. Yeah. You know, I mean, practice and all. I have a, a very good friend called Rupert Holmes, who you may have heard of, who's, he's a wonderful playwright. Um, and um and he's now finally written his third crime novel which um he'll be coming to see us for in march but i've always found it interesting he um i thought he's edmund drood on broadway i'm trying to remember whether it was called the mystery of edmund drood i think it was it was absolutely brilliant 
And then he wrote, um, I think it's called Say Goodnight, Gracie, which oh, was, yeah. yeah, which I really loved. And he's um, actually coming here in part because he has a play that's opening in Phoenix. So oh, wow. you know, another person who was doing um, both. Uh, but yeah. in this case, more frequent plays and fewer novels. In your case, more novels, I guess. And we'll see how it all goes. And, you know, is what, what you know, in terms of tradecraft, is it wildly different? Um, it is, it, I don't want to say wildly different. Um, I mean, there is simply, the, you know, the length, like a, a play is like a sprint, a, a novel is like a marathon, um, right. the writing. Um, but there's a, for mystery novels, especially, there is a real uh, overlap between playwriting and mystery writing because plays, even, even really character driven plays are still all about plot. Um, like they're all basically, I, I tell students like you have a very limited amount of theatrical real estate. Um, you have limited time, you have limited space, you have limited audience attention span. Uh, you can't have extraneous things going on on stage. Uh, like the dominoes need to like fall. Like one thing causes another, causes another, causes another. Um, and that, you know, 15 years of writing plays was great training for writing mystery novels because mysteries even character driven ones um which mine are are still super dependent on plot like one thing leads to another leads to another leads to another um it is nice that i can have subplots now you you cannot have you don't get you don't get the luxury of subplots in place um so that was the the overlap that was the venn diagram but when i first started writing novels um the big thing i had to start thinking of um was it, what the hell are people doing? Where are their hands? What do they look like? What are they wearing? What expression is on their face? Um, because I'd always had actors. <laughs> like I could give an actor, you know, here's the dialogue um, and just cast brilliantly and let them do everything else. And now I'm doing this and I'm like, I have not said what this person is doing with their physical body for a, two pages now. Uh, I really need to do that. So you have to set the scene, you know, yeah. you, have to, you have to do that, you know, maybe you have to talk about the weather, um, you know, all kinds of things that, as you point out, the, the set and the actors say for you. Yes, yes, that too. I do like, I do like that I get to like set the scene and like things like the weather and like having, having scenes take place, like running down the alleys and streets of New York, um, like things that would not work on, on not, at least not work well on stage, like big things like that. I love putting it in there. It's the little things that I'm like, oh, that's right. I need to, you know, what are they, what's their expression? How many times have they arched their eyebrow in this book? Sometimes I actually have to like, word find in my like, eyebrow and how many times I have used like the same little tiny gesture throughout a book and be like okay she can only raise her eyebrow let's say twice in this book <laughs> I love it so, like a tick use them well yes indeed so so you know plays generally have structures two or three x three I guess is the most common one although I don't know all that much about it but the the crime novel crime fiction has a structure I mean, it varies. A thriller is different than a, um, you know, an Agatha Christie is one thing, a Ken Follett is another thing, you know, um, a caper is another thing. So it's a really, really broad umbrella. But I often think that people are drawn to writing crime, especially if they have not written anything before, because there is a structure. And oftentimes it is kind of a three act structure, especially in a traditional crime novel. Yeah. I think, I, I, it's, I think of it in three acts. Um... I actively think of it in three acts when I'm writing. Uh, I don't force it into three acts, but it just sort of like naturally falls into that. I mean, you have act one where it's the inciting incident. Here's, you know, here's the dead body. Um, and you, you know, you're introduced to some, if not all of like the main cast. And then in the second act, it's more people, more complications, uh, tensions rising dangers rising and usually ending with some kind of action or emotional giant beat like some revelation or some 
you know, explosions, gunfights, things like that. Um, and then act three is like, okay, now we have everything. We have all the clues. We have all the people. Let's figure this out. Okay. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, William Pentecost and Will sitting in a room hammering out what the heck's going on. And then, you know. Well, hopefully yeah. playwriting helped you with pacing. I mean, I, that's a real problem writing. Writing yeah. um, is facing, pacing can be so difficult. So one final question before, I'm, I'm sorry, but the light is, is really getting to me. So oh, that's all right. No, 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 Pat can come up and um, ask you questions and so <laughs> forth. But I did want to ask you, um, how much fun you had in in titling the stories that Holly writes, and you know, kind of giving us a little taste of what the various novels that or stories rather she's written that are hi PK, thank you, um, <laughs> that are the basis for um, the crimes because you you had to do that. Yeah, it's 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 a lot. It was a lot of fun, like creating because Holly has multiple pseudonyms, and she writes different types of stories for each pseudonym and i got to name some of these like really pulpy yeah stories. and i was actually kind of there are times when i'm like i am giving away this title for <laughs> this one gag in this one chapter and i'm like am i ever gonna want to get that title back and actually use it i don't know um but it was a lot of it, it, that was fun yeah. it is fun there, there are a bunch of easter eggs in the story you know and particularly if you um are widely read in crime fiction. I think that there's just a lot of fun to be derived from this. Um, before I turn this over to Pat, I'm sorry, but I just the light is killing my eyes. Um, Stephen has very kindly signed multiple copies of Secrets Typed in Blood, which he is shipping to us tomorrow, I'm happy to say, and they should arrive by Friday. So let me encourage you to get one because really this is a lovely book. It's actually a great gift book. You don't have to have read any of the either of the first two in order to read this one and enjoy it. But I think on a multiple levels, it's a book you can give to people as well as read yourself and really enjoy it. PK, I'm going to sign this over to you while I go Absolutely. my eyes. Thank you all very all right. much for the time you spent. And I'll, let me wish you, Stephen, a very happy holiday and everybody watching as I fade away. And you too. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was really my Oh, there she goes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she disappeared. Um, that happens from time to time. Um, so, Stephen, um, one of the questions that our audience members actually had was, who are your, um, uh, you know, which writers do you follow? Who, who are your inspirations? And especially within the thriller and mystery genre, do you have any in particular? Yeah. Um, so, like, there's there's obviously the the old school ones like, like obviously I'm, I'm heavily influenced by rex out oh yeah um, and then you know agatha christie um as for writers working today who are my favorite i'm like i've got some on the shelves over here but i think a lot of them um like i'm a huge fan of tana french oh, um, yeah. who i share an agent with uh and actually the fact that she is agented by him is the reason i queried him in the first place um but she is, she is fantastic. Um, I, I'm such a, just reading, I'm like, I can't, I'm like, how, 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 how do you make things that brilliant? Um, so she's great. Um, speaking of people, my, like I, I share an agent with uh, John Connolly, I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. He's yeah. sort of mystery meets supernatural horror. Um, but he just had a book out called The Furies, which is actually two books in one, um, which is great. Uh, and then I'm I'm a, just a big fan of some of like the the bestseller list staples. Like I think I've read every John Sanford novel. I've read every Michael Connelly. Um, I am what else? Attica Locke. Uh, her was it Bluebird Bluebird, and then in my home i don't i cannot remember the titles um they're great yeah Luke there's a lot it is a, a gut punch of a book it is so good um and uh you know of course you she sort of surprises you with that um black cop south and eastern texas and, mm -hmm. and not quite what you're expecting um i thought that that was a fasting book we actually read that for book group when it came out and was all the buzz 
many years ago, and uh, it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, in terms of your books, I mean, you really focus on, um, you know, your characters and your drive, uh, definitely the LGBTQ history. And is that something important that you're really trying to work to get right within these books? Because you probably have a fairly high LGBTQ readership, I would assume. Yes, it is something I, I, you know, the thing that I try and work to get most right is like the, the emotional beats, like mm -hmm. the, actually the internal workings, like, like when will, like Will's feelings about things and how people would naturally react. Um, and then as for like, the, and, and I want to be true to the history, but I don't, I'm not always like, sometimes I make things up like I will make up oh this club never like there's a in book one there is a like sort of a a, a gay friendly club uh, or at least gay semi-gay accepting club in like uh, Harlem like the border between like Columbia University and Harlem um, which it did not exist in real life places like it existed um, but like sp that specific place did not exist um, so like that kind of I will I am comfortable making up that kind of thing, um, especially since I'm telling fictional stories and I'm right you know I'm having you know people die and like other people end up being murderers, um, so I want to leave all that in the realm of the fiction, um, but I want that fiction to be true mm -hmm. at the same time, um, which I find is is just trying it's really about what is what is possible and not possible in the time period how people would actually respond and react to yeah. the situation and like the confines of the society that they're do you do you have any beta readers that you throw uh will's uh, uh reactions to etc to kind of get an idea of whether or not those always strike true i have a, yeah i do have a i have a, I have a few beta, beta a few beta readers um my wife is my first beta reader mm -hmm. uh and it's funny like she we've we've talked about this a lot um we talking about barbara about plot and how like mysteries are very about plot um and i think my mine is, and we talk about like uh plot versus vibes yeah. um and i think my books are like sort of like i think they're like 70% plot, 30% vibes, um, which is like a lot of vibes for a mystery. My wife, on the other hand, writes like 80% vibes, 20% plot. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we give each other notes, because um, we read for each other, like my, I am usually very helpful in helping her plot. And yeah. she is very helpful <laughs> in uh, sort of like tracking and interrogating the emotions of characters. Um, because in book in Fortune Favors the Dead, uh, like I gave it to her, and her giant note she came back was like, "Can you please tell me more about Will's feelings throughout the entire book? Just tell me what she's feeling about these things." Um, and then, and and like that note made me re-examine everything, like re-examine the entire novel, and it became much more about Will's reaction to the things around her and her personal growth, the things around her. So like. So yeah, that my wife as a beta reader is responsible for probably why people like these books and why I still like writing them. Um, you know, but it takes a village, right? Yeah. Uh, we get so focused on what we're writing or what we're reading or, you know, I, I write code for a living. That's my day job. And then I work for Barbara at night and uh, I have a great time doing it, but you get so focused on what you're doing. Sometimes you don't see uh, those little gaps that you do and, and somebody comes in and says, okay, well, what if you said it this way? And um, it's the same thing, I, th I think, from coding and writing. If you have somebody who's a little bit further away, they can give you a really interesting perspective. Yeah. Yeah. After If you spend like six, eight months, you know, draft after draft after draft after yeah. draft, you get, you get word blind. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 100%. So what's it like, uh, both of you writing, probably both working full time on your writing careers in the same house? How do you guys manage that without getting in each other's way? But also, um, 
you know, how do you work around that with the from a professional and personal? Uh, practice, like a, like a lot of practice. Um, like we've been together. Oh, married fifty. How old am I? I just turned forty-five. We've, I mean, we've been we've been together over twenty years. Um, so it's like a lot of practice. Um, I have like I have my office in the basement. She has her office on the second floor. Uh, so like we have personal space where we can write. Um, and and also like we, we we neither of us are well. I guess I am a full-time author in the sense that like I write novels, but I'm also like my other job is a journalist. Um, I guess teaching also. So. Like, we're not full-time she's a part-time librarian uh you know part-time not or full-time novelist part-time librarian um because writing is takes up all the time full-time regardless um so like you know we we have learned how to give each other notes um but we also have other things in our life so we're, neither of us are thinking about writing all the time and like our conversations are not are like 95 percent not writing you know, That's it's good. the normal conversations that you have. Yeah. Sometimes you hear with husbands and wives who are both uh, writing, you know, well, one writes in the morning, the other one writes at night, you know, you have very different schedules. Um, and obviously with your wife uh, writing a uh, young adult that, uh, doesn't she do young adult? I I apologize. If I'm, yes, I'm, no, she does young adult. Oh, okay, she, okay. To date, yeah that you guys are writing a little bit different enough of a genre to really um, be able to be critical of each other's work. You're not working in the same venue. Yeah, we have different, yeah, we have different wheelhouses and different yeah. passions, yeah. It, it's sort of interesting because I'm the science fiction fantasy selector here at the store. And I'm finding that, especially within science fiction and fantasy, there really is a trend of uh, bringing in um, characters of color, characters of different genders, characters, you know, um, struggling with personal identity, um, et cetera. And it's really becoming um, uh, more and more accepted. Do you think with 10 years ago, Willa would have been as accepted within the community now? Because it seems like there are books that are insanely popular, like Nona the Ninth that are dealing primarily with lesbian characters. Oh, Nona the Ninth. Um, oh man, Gideon the Ninth is like or Gideon the Ninth. And, my, well, no, they're know. all the Ninth. It's Gideon, yeah. Arrow, and Nona. But like, just I, uh, I love that book. Um, no, it probably it probably would not even ten years ago. Probably not. Um, yeah. And, uh, hopefully, ten years from now. It will be like people will not like, there will be more that will be accepted um and that won't get people won't blink do you uh, feel like your books help um help with that narrative i hope so um some of the nicest messages i get from readers um and i've gotten several that are along the same lines of uh uh, from from like mostly young women um, who just liked like they, they they didn't read much or they didn't read mystery much because they didn't expect to see themselves in the story mm -hmm. um, and the somebody recommended my book to them and um, and they just they were really appreciative of of having. A story where like you didn't they didn't have to cut and paste in order to insert themselves into the narrative mm -hmm. um which we have been asking you know minorities um to do for ever um yeah. so yeah hopefully hopefully it helps hopefully it becomes just like you know just man flood the zone flood the zone to like nobody so like oh it's it's a gay protagonist it's okay mm -hmm. so yeah um, exactly instead of like we you know pixar has one couple kissing and you know the world burns down <laughs> which is where we are still but i i i think that some people just like to make uh mountains out of molehills to be real honest and and uh that was something to get very upset about with without without really any just cause mm -hmm. um 
So Stephen, around you, it's clear that you have a love of some culture, uh, some being a fellow geek. Uh, it looks like you've got plenty of action figures and things around you that are really colorful and and vibrant. Is is that something that you need around you to write every day? <laughs> no, it's, it's, I don't need to. I don't need it. Um, the thing is, I have. So we live in a row house, um, which means that we are limited in space. Um, my office is eight by 10. Um, okay. and, and this is, and I try to keep all of, all of my toys to like one limited area. I don't want it to spread throughout the rest of the house. Um, partly because we have a cat uh, and things will go missing. Um, exactly. Yeah. So really it's just, and, and I got into more into collecting over the pandemic because this is just one of those ways to emotionally cope with being stuck or inside all the time. And it's like, oh, there's a way I can get tiny little bursts of serotonin <laughs> <laughs> in tiny packages being delivered. Um, so yeah, so it's like my, my, my office has turned into this little, little, I don't know, cave of tiny figures. Um, then of collection, so to speak. Yeah. Yes. I just finished an interview with Sam Sykes just uh, shortly before he, I, I was talking with you about his new book, Three Axes to Fall. And we had a we had a minor geek out session about uh, the video game Elden Ring that just won game of the year. So uh, I think uh, we all understand, you know, just a, a little bit of that fun, you know, that you kind of need, especially around uh, uh, COVID. I think mm -hmm. I, I played way too much Animal Crossing and built way too many... Uh, uh, my, you know, spent way too much time uh, building my village. But Stephen, your series is excellent. I do give them to a lot of my Mystery of the Month readers because I think that they are um, not only great uh, plotted books, but the characters are so vibrant. And so um, it's such a enjoyable read. Uh, what's what's the next book on your project? And, and um uh, you know, what are we going to see from you um, in the next coming few years? The next few years? Um, well, you'll see book four in the series, um, which just went to copy edits um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and yeah, hopefully more beyond that. I, I, like, I am willing to write these characters for as long as people are willing to pay me money to write these characters <laughs> um and and because like it, you know it's because it takes place in the past i really can condense that I, I can make 10 years last you know 30 novels um exactly and then, and then still go back and like fill in the little gaps um don't it doesn't have to be one of the real challenges that ian rankin had with with his john rebus series was aging rebus in real time Right. So after a while, he had aged himself out and he had written himself in a corner, mm -hmm. whereas writing historical, you really can. You The world is yours. Yeah. yeah. Except, but at, although at the same time, to to play fair with with Lillian Pentecost and MS, like things, things got time must move on um, just to be realistic with that. However, uh, time can move as slowly as, <laughs> as I wanted to. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Have her deal with those situations and and dealing with that health crisis, and and you know hopefully uh, you know uh, I'm sure she'll she'll be fine for many more book. Yeah, I'm not gonna we're not Kill her her yet. No, exactly. Um, in terms of that, is there anything that um, uh, you're watching right now or reading right now that you'd like to bring light to? Um, I am right in the middle of, um, like the book is out of the room and I just want to make sure I don't mess up the title. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm in the middle of reading Killers of a Certain Age, um, by Deanna Rayborn, yeah, um, which is just so much fun. Uh, like I, like basically it's a, a group of, uh, not senior citizen, but like retirement age assassins, like they're retiring and they are targeted for death by their own organization. Um, somebody's trying to kill them. Um, so you have these like women in their I guess sixties, um, uh, having to do to just be awesome. 
spies um, and murderers and yeah, that, I don't know. If, if, if you read it, I'm, you can probably do a better job of explaining. I'm only halfway through, so I'm still. It's one of my favorite books of the year. I do have to say that Killers of a Certain Age, I, I don't think it made it to my top 10, but it was probably number 11 which I thought, I thought it was so much fun and just really a great book. Deanna Rayborn is a good friend of the store and uh, really a lot of fun. Um, but, um, you know, your book is fantastic too. We are getting them this week. Um, for those of you who are wanting to sponsor Stephen um, and you're enjoying programs like this, please don't hesitate to buy books from The Poison Pen. Uh, we ship all over the world, um, and the more you buy, the cheaper it is to ship, unfortunately, but that's the case. Thank you, United States Post Service, for forcing small businesses to do that. But um, also, Stephen, when people are done with their next book and they want to follow more of you, where can they follow you? Where can they stalk you? Um, you can stalk me. I am I am uh, Playwright Steve on uh, Instagram. Uh, TikTok and at least for now Twitter um, and you can also my website is stephenspotswood.com which I try and keep updated with with all the news fantastic and for those of you who want to purchase book of course you can go to the poison pen uh, purchase one but wherever you purchase your book uh, and we encourage you to do so because not only does it help bookstores like us stay in business it helps keep authors like Stephen writing the characters that we know and we love. So uh, don't don't forget to vote with your dollar. And uh, Stephen, if you want to stick around just for a moment, I'll go ahead. We'll say good night to our Twitter yeah. and our Facebook and our YouTube folks. And uh, we hope you have a very happy holiday. Yeah. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated, please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.